Welcome to Upstream. I'm Shane Morris. We've all heard stories of people who were convinced of Christianity through the work of apologists, through good arguments and defenses of the faith offered by everyone from Augustine and Aquinas to C.S. Lewis and Lee Strobel. But have you ever met someone who was convinced of Christianity because he studied the arguments by skeptics against it and found them so absurd and contradictory that he knew Jesus must be Lord? Well, at the risk of oversimplifying things, that was the story of G.K. Chesterton, and he chronicles it in his astonishingly rich book called Orthodoxy. Well, I just finished this book for the first time, and I know that I'm going to be reading it for years to come. But it's not easy to wrap your head around, despite not really being a long book. Chesterton's prose is charged with meaning and illusion, incredibly clever and artful. Every word of every sentence serves a purpose. It's there for a reason. And it's not always easy to tell what the purpose is, especially when the references he, he makes are over a century old. Well, that's why I'm excited to welcome to the program today a fellow Chesterton appreciator who's got much more experience appreciating him under his belt, uh, who's just written an annotated guide to orthodoxy. Trevin Wax is Vice President of Research and Resource Development at the North American Mission Board and a visiting professor at Wheaton College. He's a regular columnist at the Gospel Coalition and has served as general editor of the Gospel Project. He's authored several books, including uh, one of my favorites, Rethink Yourself, which I spoke with him about last time he was on the program. And today we're talking about his latest. It's orthodoxy with annotations and guided reading, and I'm excited to dig deeper into Chesterton's best-known book with him. Trevin, welcome back to Upstream, brother. Shane, great to be back with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, I have just begun my Chesterton phase, as my listeners know, and I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm very impressed by him. Uh, I know this is going to, he's going to turn out to be a spiritual pillar for me long term. Uh, tell me about your appreciation for Chesterton. How did you get into him? So it, it, it really started with me with, with C.S. Lewis. Um, Lewis in Surprised by Joy talks about how he started reading Chesterton. I believe if we look at journals and stuff, it was around the time of uh, when he was convalescing in, in World War I after he'd been injured. Uh, or it might have been when he had um, a trench fever. There were a couple of times that he uh, was was away from the front and was reading things. And and he talks about how Chesterton just immediately made a conquest of him, and he's not exactly sure why. Of course, he was an atheist at the time. And so Lewis talked about Chesterton. He talked about The Everlasting Man, one of Chesterton's books, being, uh, he, he says in a letter, it's the, it's the greatest popular apologetic out there in English. Um, and so, yeah, I always knew that there was this sort of link between Lewis and Chesterton. And then and then everywhere you look, he's quoted. I mean, Chesterton, he is one of the most quotable people from the past century, one of the the just witty sayings, clever aphorisms. I mean, just so eminently quotable. So yeah, you you know, you hear about him and you 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 read about him, but then you you're like, I at one point I thought, well, if Lewis liked him this much and I like Lewis, I should I should dip in myself. And so I I it was back in uh, 2010. I uh, I read through Orthodoxy, and just to be frank, I don't think I understood half of it. But there were these little nuggets of like just these sentences or like these little points that were made throughout where there was some of it was so dense. I was like, I really don't know what he's saying here. But then I'd get to some sort of point or sense or a sub point and I would just be floored. And so when I finished it, my my reaction was similar to that. I've heard uh, John Piper say this. John Piper rarely reads a book twice. But when he got to the end of Orthodoxy, it's one of the only books in his life that he, as soon as he finished the last page, he turned it right back to the beginning and started the first page and read the entire book again. Um, you know there's gold and treasure there, and you have to work hard to to discover it, to follow the line of argumentation. And I've read Orth I, I I started reading Chesterton soon after that because he may he makes the world come alive. Like I in not just in orthodoxy, but in other stuff. Like this is a guy who was marveling at the glory of human existence and the world around us and the marvels that we have every day. And no one helps me see things better than Chesterton and to be filled with wonder more than Chesterton. And that's why I keep going back to him. That's why I've read Orthodoxy probably 10 or more times now to, to really let his, his way of seeing the world seep into my, to my, to my mind. Mm, I think he actually gives away 
part of his primary appeal in this book, and we'll talk about it in a second. It's that idea of a patriotism toward reality and a, and a sort of grounded optimism on that basis or, or a, a really deep hope on that basis. But when I had um, Dale Alquist on the podcast a few weeks ago, uh, president of the American Chesterton Society, he he sort of dug into why Chesterton has this enduring appeal and what it is about his spirit through all his work that just grabs hold of people. And he, he used his nickname, you know, the laughing prophet. This is a guy who, um, he never seemed to be, uh, flustered or, or discouraged by the state of what he was talking about. It, it, it always seemed like he kept eternity in his mind. And at the end of this book, um, you know, I, I actually just kind of looked up and there were tears in my eyes when I finished it because it was he was talking about Jesus's mirth, you know, and how <clears throat> this this thing called the mirth of God, the laughter of heaven, it was too wonderful for paganism to understand. And it flipped paganism on its head. But he he has this idea that Christianity at its heart is a religion of, of mirth and joy and good humor and that God in himself is happy. And he wants to share that happiness with us. And I think that's what you get from Chesterton, right? It's like, it's oozing oh, yeah. out of him, every word he writes. <laughs> Even the really prophetic, like one, some of the, there's a few books where it's almost, the tone is striking because it's, it's not that sort of exuberance, like uh, eugenics and other evils is one that he talks about, in which he really prophetically looks at the kind of society, he he's going against all the progressives of his day who were pro-eugenics, right? You know, let's um, sterilize the poor and let's sterilize the populations that we don't want to see more of, you know, and like, and, and was seeing that and seeing where that led, even in the days before Hitler. I mean, we're talking, um, you know, decades before the horrors of the Holocaust were, were unleashed. But he, even in a book like that, um, it, it's almost as if when you see Chesterton at his, at, at his, at his, at his, like when he's wielding the sword of his words the most, it's still out of this fundamental joy and gratitude for existence. And so, um, so yeah, it comes out. I knew after I started reading, after I read Orthodoxy and then, uh, reread it and then started reading some of his stuff, I knew I had found, this is the writer I'm going to read for the rest of my life. I will, I, I will be reading Chesterton until the day I die, because I, I was so moved by his spirit, by the wisdom, by the wit, all of that. And, and so my, my joke has been like, it, 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 you know, when I, when I come across C.S. Lewis in heaven, I will thank him for Narnia. And then I'm going to say, basically, thank you for introducing me to Chesterton. Right. Cause I, I see so much of where it, the more you read Chesterton, the more you actually see the fingerprints of Chesterton in Lewis's mm -hmm. work. Like you see the illusions and over and I, I read over New again. Christianity not that long ago and was like, Oh yeah, the poached egg thing. Yeah. He got yeah. that from <laughs> I caught he that too. It, you know, like there's so many things. So it's just, it's, it's great to, to sit at the feet of one, uh, of someone who's absolutely brilliant and, uh, uh, prophetic and joyful all at the same time. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to, um, agree with, find myself in agreement with Lewis about Chesterton. And I can see, like you said, Lewis's own debt to Chesterton, both in terms of his, um, his thinking and his spirit. But it brings up uh, kind of an obvious question. And I want to dive into orthodoxy here itself. But before we do, um, you would describe yourself as a Calvinist. You're a reformed Protestant. Is that right? I would, it depends on who you okay. ask. <laughs> but so you're not, you're not I'm, Roman I'm, Catholic. I'm, no, I'm not Roman okay. Catholic. I'm a Reformed Protestant. I would completely agree with, there's a, a, a confession of faith that came out not long ago called the Reforming Catholic Confession, which is a, it was in honor of the, the two of the five, 500th anniversary of the Reformation put together by like Timothy George and Kevin Van Hooser and some people like that. So yeah, I would be on the Reformed side of the spectrum and and when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, probably more on the line of Calvinism versus Arminianism for sure. But but I'm also not a you know the the the, the typical or the classic five point Calvinist and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So because of that, it raises the question. You know, we are Protestants um, who have a great appreciation, a burgeoning appreciation for this. Roman Catholic writer, this convert to Catholicism, right, um, who has been sort of instrumental in introducing people over the years to Catholicism, who throughout his work makes asides and remarks to the effect that Calvinism is a twisted or heretical version of the faith. 
Um, are we making a mistake drawing people toward Chesterton here? What is the ground of our um, of our support for him? So, so first of all, um, I, I I would put it this way: as a um, when when I think of Chesterton from a Protestant's eyes, um, Chesterton did convert to Catholicism later. It was 1922. He wrote Orthodoxy in like 1908. So he was still pretty much a a high Anglican, high Church Anglican at the at the time he wrote Orthodoxy, and specifically doesn't speak to issues of Catholicism and Protestantism, which is one of the reasons why I think so many Catholics and Protestants appreciate Orthodoxy because he's not he's not doing a, a, a an apologetic for Roman Catholicism in particular. He has some other books that do that, um, one called The Thing and some others. So uh, so Chesterton do, is an apologist for Catholicism in certain books, but this is not one of them. Um, secondly, um, the reason that one of the reasons for Chesterton's departure from Anglicanism into Catholicism was this this um if you if you read him carefully, you're recognizing he's noticing things and he's you know with that prophetic sense about him, he's looking to the future and he's recognizing that the church in what it was beginning to do in the move toward uh, relaxing some standards and and on divorce, for example, or on uh, contraception and things like that, which had not at that point had not really been entertained by the the Christian tradition in all 1900 years of of the church at that time. He, he's watching a church that's not acting like a church with with some priests in the time during the whole fundamentalist modernist controversy who were no longer, you know, believing in the virgin birth, for example, that that's an actual literal, literal miracle and things like that. So even though I, you know, obviously I remain a Protestant and and will remain a Protestant, um, I, I recognize some of the the cultural currents and what was happening during the time, which would make Chesterton sympathetic toward the the the, the Roman uh, Catholic view, um, and in his his study of history. But I but I also I would also just say this: Chesterton's one of those guys, kind of like Lewis in this way. You don't really read Lewis and Chesterton uh, for theology. It, it's not it's not what you're going for. Like there are much greater theologians than. I mean, obviously they dabble in some theology, but Chesterton at the end of the day is a journalist. And so you're reading him today like you'd read a blog, you know, like like you'd read a blogger today, or you'd read a columnist from some magazine or something that you might get a lot out of, but you're not necessarily looking to him for, uh, you know, for a, a particular, uh, you're not looking at for him in the way that he he does theology. And what I've found to be helpful about Chesterton, and one of the reasons why I think Protestants and Catholics alike really appreciate him, and even some Eastern Orthodox now, is 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 the way that he is able to. Uh, it, it's it's the 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 spirit and the posture with which he approaches theology, debate, issues of of society as concern. The way the um, his ability to be really good friends with people who are completely different from him. I mean, his friendship with George Bernard Shaw, for example, is legendary. And yet those two were like polar opposites philosophically in all sorts of ways. There's really a model there of charitable and friendly engagement when you're dueling, though, over some of the most foundational, fundamental aspects of of human existence and about and of uh, Christianity. So Chesterton is an apologist First and foremost for Christianity. Some of his later writings, yes, he becomes a more of an apologist for Catholicism in particular. But even in those books, um, he he is his um, uh, his 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 apology for Catholicism. A lot of what he makes as an apology for for Roman Catholicism is actually something that would be a good defense of Christianity just in general. So even there, there's a lot that just that translates over pretty substantially. And so he's one of these people, you know, I don't agree with him on everything and, and certainly think he gets some things wrong. I think he, he uh, uh, makes some sweeping claims and judgments at times without really digging into the details. But that's not why I'm reading him anyway. I'm reading him for the wisdom that comes out of the other, the, 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 the work that, that he does uh, on more broadly. Yeah, it's funny. It seems to me like the readers of Chesterton are a bit more sectarian than Chesterton himself, a lot more sectarian. Because, you know, on the one hand, you've got the the hardcore Protestants who are going, well, why are you reading the this Roman Catholic writer? You know, what could he possibly have to, to offer you by way of edification and theological um, improvement? And then there are Catholics on the other side who they find out I'm reading Chesterton and they're like, 
you're going to convert. You're, you know, you're going to become Catholic. And it's like, it, there's this attitude that if you don't become Roman Catholic after reading Chesterton, well, then you didn't read him rightly. And I think that both, I mean, I, I think people of good will on both sides can admit that G.K. Chesterton is a lot more than just uh, a sort of, um, you know, polemical, apologetical tool for whatever your particular institutional church happens to be, that he's saying something a lot bigger about Christianity in the modern world, um, much like C.S. Lewis was. And that's what that's why there's a common thread in the spirit between these two men, where obviously it runs one way. Lewis is being inspired by, um, by Chesterton. But both men are consciously um, doing something that I think, you know, Chesterton might, might have agreed with C.S. Lewis in calling mere Christianity, that there is something to be defended here that is a grand tradition that, you know, a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox can read this and say, yes, there's something in here for me. And I think that's, you know, that's a big part of his appeal as well. Um, one uh, one final question for you here uh, before we dive into the, the content of the book. What is orthodoxy? Like if you were going to explain the purpose and the the you know nature of this book. What is it? Why did Chesterton write it? Um, how how would you make the case for someone to read this as a unique treasure? Yeah, well, he calls it a slovenly autobiography in the in the beginning part of the the book. It basically he wrote a book called Heretics before this, which was not a book about like the ancient heretics of the church, like Arius and you know, people like that. It, it's, it, he's not, he, he was going after modern day writers and he was basically, and he was calling them heretics, but he was, he was engaging with their thought in a really engaging way. And heretics was a, was a pretty big book. Like it was a big seller. It, it caused a lot of attention and stir. Uh, Chesterton's wit is fully on display in that. So that's kind of like a orthodoxy in some sense is a sequel to heretics because one of the, the, the way that orthodoxy starts out is one of the ways that, um, uh, one of the responses to to uh, uh, to heretics was one of those authors saying, uh, one of the reviewers saying, "Look, you know, we'll talk about what our philosophy of life is once Chesterton tells us what his is." Because basically, Chesterton had done this negative thing in which he had just kind of just you know was aiming and firing at all these other other people, and you've got this one you got this one reviewer who says, "Okay, well then tell us what you think. Show us your like, cards, where man. are you?" Yeah. Yeah, show us who you are, because you know Chesterton at that time was already famous for his his literary appreciation of Charles Dickens and other things, and so, uh, it, but not really, he wasn't really famous as an apologist for anything except to, you know he was just commenting on things, and so Chesterton said, okay, well I'll write the book. This is it. This is how I, you know, and and the the funny thing about the book is that he he starts off by saying. You know, I, I did a lot of deep thinking, I did a lot of reading, and I, I wanted to sort of found a heresy of my own. And then when I put the finishing touches on it, I realized it was orthodoxy. He realized he said it's like it's like being a guy who decides he's gonna sail off from England to discover the world, to discover India or whatever, and he winds up coming back to the own to his own island and seeing the pal you know, Brighton Palace, which has that, you know, that 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 uh Indian looking way and and then, and for a moment, thinking he's discovered India, when he actually realizes, no, he's just arrived back home, and that's how that's how he he felt like his life was, his life journey when it comes to philosophy was, and so orthodoxy is his. It's it's sort of a it's not his, he writes an autobiography. It's the last book he wrote before he died, actually. So he actually has a, an autobiograph autobiographical book, but this is sort of the journey of his uh, of his of, of his. Uh, um, or it's the story of the journey uh, into Christian uh, Christianity, into Christian teaching, into recognizing that Christianity is like the key that fits the lock. This is what makes sense of everything. And so it is all over the place in the way that journey happens with someone like a Chesterton. But that's really where the book came from, and that's why that's why he wrote it. It's it's as if by accident that he stumbles across orthodoxy. I love that line that he set out to found his own heresy based on his own sort of reading of the world. And he starts in this very um, you know, elementary way about how, here's how the world works. Here's how I read it. Here are patterns I noticed. And then all of a sudden I realized that um, the, the thing that fit this pattern in instance after instance after instance is Christianity. And, it, you know, we'll, we'll walk through this, but at first he, he thinks, well, this is, you know, this must be a very strangely sinister heresy that it, you know, it has such cunning that gets so many things right. But 
when you approach this book, I I found out that you can't approach it like you would approach, say, Herman Bovink, where you are, where he's going to be giving you a lot of didactic statements, right? He's giving you statements about, or propositional statements, I should say, things about doctrine. Chesterton offers you something really different. He offers you a series of images, and they're images that are put together in a very tight, um, mutually reinforcing literary way. So, like, as a writer, I'm looking at what he's doing, and I'm just in awe at his economy of words and his the grace and abil- his ability to turn a phrase and his ability to use plant and payoff constantly. You know, where he's like, here's a thing that you got to keep in your head. And then six paragraphs later, he brings it up and bow, you know, drives the point home. And you're like, ha, that's kind of like what you said earlier. And, you know, Yzma's like, I know, it's called a cruel irony. <laughs> but um, that's right. That's right. So, so you mentioned the first image, which is the yachtsman. And that's in the introduction. So he sets out to rediscover or discover, uh, you know, what the world is like. And he ends up finding England, which is Christianity metaphorically. Um, what What is the central image in this first chapter, it's called the maniac. What is he doing there? Why is he talking about insane and insane asylum? Well, yeah, that image is really is really important because he's basically instead of beginning with sin as the starting point in talking about redemption, he begins with sanity as the starting point, and he asks the question, "What is sanity? What brings about uh, sanity?" And that's that is a he he's making the case there and and you got to understand the time that he's living in he's living in the you know this advance of technology and science and this is post darwin and all of this and so he's got this you know there's this materialism the the free thinkers of his time are basically denying the supernatural um they're they're denying the miracles they're denying the the anything outside of our own uh, imminent frame, you know, out of anything outside of our, our world and the world of sense and material. And so Chesterton is basically saying that actually is an insane way to live. That if you start with sanity in the insane asylum there, and he, and he talks about how logic and reason and rational rationality are wonderful, but, and he's not against them at all, but he's saying, if that's all you have, you're insane. You're insane. And he's talking about the need for imagination, the need for a bit of mysticism in the world, the need for wonder and awe and marveling at things. He he basically talks about how, you know, someone who who goes insane and thinks they're the king of England or thinks they're Jesus Christ or that they're he he talks about how basically it's a conspiracy theory where everything is fit so neatly into into shape and everything makes complete logical sense in the mind of that person. But because they're actually the world is not just about logic and rational rationality and reason that without that that sense of mysticism and mystery and wonder and recognizing that there are things that we don't uh, understand we are we are are driven mad we get we we wind up in the prison of one idea which is yeah, is actually a great way of looking at so many different things today. Like, I mean, you, this is the thing about Chesterton. He, he gives you this image and then you see how it applies. Like, I mean, the, the prison of one idea happens even today when there are people that are completely convinced, you know, that basically everything in the world is actually, it's all, everything that happens is uh, 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 the pursuit of power, for example. This is one of, you know, it's uh, Nietzsche and um, postmodernism, the the hermeneutic of suspicion. Everything is a power play. It underlies a lot of the recent conversations about race and every interaction being seen as, you know, how did racism manifest itself in this situation instead of asking, was there any racism in that situation? Like those kinds of questions. But it's that same sort of you, you don't have this wider world there that is ready, so you wind up in putting everything in the prison of that one idea, and that's what leads to the asylum, and that's what actually leads us to um, uh, to to a, a fatalism that that is detrimental to the human soul and spirit. There's a circularity to it. In fact, he, he goes into a, a sort of contrast between the circle as a religious and philosophical shape and the cross as a religious and philosophical shape, um, and his... You know, I found his point both um, salient and chilling that pure logic can drive you insane and that when you talk to an insane person, the thing you'll notice about them is not uh, that they're loosey-goosey about details, but that they are obsessively focused on details. They know their story. They've got it all worked out and there's a perfect circle of mutually reinforcing propositions that if you try to break into it, you know, you fit in there as someone who's part of the conspiracy. 
What you know? Who, who, why are you saying that I'm? You say I'm not Napoleon? That's exactly what someone who's trying to convince me I'm not Napoleon would say. You know, <laughs> you're part of the conspiracy. Right. Um, and he sees this as like a description of the philosophies of his day, which is so interesting and and, and um, powerful because it draws you right out of the arena of like rational discourse or rationalistic discourse, I should say, and into the arena of common sense which is something Chesterton is so good at, um, marshalling common sense to the defense of what he sees as reality, which is Christianity. So the next chapter is called The Suicide of Thought. Um, walk us through Chesterton's critique of materialism as the suicide of thought. I mean, we kind of alluded it, alluded to it there. Um, but how, where does he go in this chapter? Why is he talking about the suicide of thought? Um, and then what's his central image to help us sort of grasp this? Well, this is the chapter, it's probably the hardest chapter I tell people, if you can make it through this chapter, you're well on your way to finishing the book. And that's because he is doing the the, the really difficult work of engaging with a lot of authors, that most of whom have not, you've never really heard of. Um, and so this is where he's, he's, he's walking through the, you know, he's surveying the landscape of contemporary thought. And he's showing how this sort of intellectual skepticism, the idea that we can't really know anything, um, how it leads to a dead end. It leads to, it, it's basically thought committing suicide. It, uh, one of the things he says is, you know, there really is a thought that stops all other thoughts. And that is the thought that we must stop. <laughs> because if you get to this point where you, where you really can know nothing, uh, when there, it's this radical sort of skepticism where you're never going to build a foundation upon which to do further re research and discovery and whatnot, then you really can't go on anymore. It's the, it's the reduction of all philosophy down to this, to, you know, to this one uh, um, uh, point. Uh, but towards the end of that chapter, he starts to talk about what, what we actually need is, um, uh, is humility. We need a modesty, not in, in um, uh, that we can't really know anything. That's where he says there's been a misplaced humility that's taking place in his society, where basically we've got people that are too humble to admit that they know the multiplication table. He's saying like you get to this point where if you basically say, well, we really can't know anything and you can't be certain about anything. Well, then that stops all future exploration because you can't build on anything. You can't actually, if you don't, if you can't even be sure of the multiplication table, then you can't do any additional, any more difficult sums. You can't do additional mathematics. So um, he's making the, the, the case that Skepticism, materialism, evolution, pragmatism, each of these eventually arrive at a place, it's a dead end where no more thought can take place. And over it, and all of them are are always assailing and, and putting themselves up against religious authority. Um, in defense of and and what and what um Chesterton says, it's actually religious authority, the understanding that you've got to have first principles, that you've got to have something that you've taken on by faith in order to get anywhere. That's what makes room for reason. So it's not reason versus faith. It's faith making the space for reason to actually to, to, to take place. It, it, he, he's going after Nietzsche with the whole emphasis on the will and a lot of the, 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 the people in his time. It's a, it's a harder chapter to get through, but if you follow the, the logic and the pattern, this is where he kind of winds up at his own dead end, and then that's where the next chapter begins to take us into more of, a, a, of the... The, the 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 beauty of what Christian teaching is all about. As he's telling his story in this chapter, um, you know, he this is sort of autobiographical, a slovenly autobiography. What stage is he in? Where where is he at in relation to Christianity and skepticism at this point in his journey? So Chesterton wound up in the 1890s having an encounter at some point. He was at an art school and he had an he he basically had arrived at a at a place of deep despair deep despair. It was, it was depression, despair. I mean, really despairing that life, really a life with no significance and meaning whatsoever. And, um, he came out of that by recognizing that the one fundamental thing that we cannot, that cannot be denied in his mind is that existence is better than non-existence. And so this is where, again, that's a first principle for Chesterton. It's also one of the reasons he never got over that sense of wonder and awe at the world. Um, and so that, that, understanding that existence is better than non-existence. And then that sort of sense that if I do exist, I should be grateful for existence. And if I'm grateful, there must be someone to be grateful to. Like that's sort of this path that begins to unfold ahead of him as he, as he 
as he follows that that line of thinking. So he arrives at the dead end. I, I mean, in some ways, he's yeah, he's interacting with philosophers of his time, but in, in his own uh, mental journey and in, intellectual journey in the in the 1890s, he got to this spot, mm. and then he began to come out of it. I think the turn that takes place here from that chapter to the next chapter, which is called The Ethics of Elfland, um, is one of the most beautiful and exciting things that Chesterton ever wrote. And this is, you know, many people's favorite chapter because of a lot of the images he used in here. Some of the some of the um, phrasing and just some of the quotable snippets are incredible. So you'll see a lot of classic quotes from this chapter. Um, but the thing that it seems to me he's he's doing is very very similar to to Lewis and this is part of the appeal for me where Lewis for Lewis what he called joy was a seed in his life um, that he pursued for years and that eventually led him to Christ first to theism then to Christ Chesterton it seems to me is doing something really similar here and he has this idea that he calls Elfland and there's this seed of wonder in the world that he followed um, over the course of his journey. Tell us what Elfland is and what it has to do with his overall intellectual journey. So he basically, he goes back to the nursery and to where, to the fairy tales that he learned as a kid. And so when he's talking about Elfland, he's talking about the, the, the worlds of fairy tales and why things are the way they are and the certain laws that you find in that sort of, in those sort of societies, you know, like Cinderella's got to be back by midnight, you know, or, uh, you know, the, the go, I mean, so many of these, everything sort of hinges in these stories on, on one command or one rule that cannot be broken, you know? And, but then also sort of the magic and wonder of these stories, he goes back to that as if to, to talk about how there is this, childlike wonder that should be the response of people to existence and something that we, uh, um, a this deep and abiding sense of gratitude that we should, that we should have. And so, um, it's, it's the strangeness, it's the wonder of these fairy tales that he keeps going back to. And it leads him to the question, well, if there is a, if these, if the story of existence is so marvelous, there must be a storyteller, right? So he's, he's beginning to sort of find his way to God from the nursery, the common sense fairy tales and things that we that we hear. But along the way, I mean, there is so much in this in this uh, chapter that is is memorable. I mean, that you may have heard the phrase uh, uh, "the democracy of the dead." You know that tradition means giving a vote to our ancestors, not just to those who are in the arrogant oligarchy of those who happen to be walking around at the time. Which I love. I love the image of no. We part of democracy is that we also we extend votes to those who have gone before us. Like we're not, you know, self-made that we come from, from tradition. That sounds like election um, fraud. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is something, uh, um, uh, yeah, to, if you apply it today, people might, might get the wrong impression right. of what, what we mean when we say we extend the vote, but it just, it's that idea of, I'm going to listen to authorities that have come before me that have done some of the work. Again, I want to build on something. I don't want to create something brand new. I want to build on something. That's a, a key theme in orthodoxy that you're discovering, not inventing. Um, but my my very favorite moment of orthodoxy comes in this chapter, um, where he is he's sort of arguing with the materialists, the naturalists, who say, "Oh, look at nature. It's just like a mechanism. It's just clockwork. Everything's just repeating over and over and over again. It shows that there's no life in it. It shows that there's no." You know, and Chesterton completely turns the tables on that argument and basically says it the 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 sign of repetition is is the sign of life and vitality. And he uses the example of of, of an adult who's uh, throwing a child up and down in the air again and again. And what does the what does the child say? Do it again, do it again. You know, the child wants you to read the story again. You know, can do it again, do it again. And basically Chesterton, he gets to that um uh to that to that realization when he he suddenly realizes and i'm looking to see because he he says it so so perfectly here he says um you know uh they do it they say do it again and the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony but perhaps god is strong enough to exult in monotony it is possible that god says every morning do it again to the sun and every evening do it again to the moon It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, 
for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Like that whole line, the, the idea of the repetition and uh, repetition in nature being an encore is just stunning. It's like one of those paragraphs that just blows you away uh, of thinking of, you know, something that someone can look at and say, nature is just, nature is just all, you know, foreordained and, and fatalistic and it's all naturalistic. And the repetition is just like a, a, a mechanism and to be able to to flip the tables and say no, this is the 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 beauty and the mystery and the wonder of existence is why I think this chapter is so 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 uh, important and beloved by so many people. You mentioned I was so glad to find that you mentioned Rich Mullins in the uh, introduction because I've been a lifelong fan of Rich and um, his. I, I I think that there was a key juncture in my life where my whole I think my whole salvation was probably riding on his music. Um, but imagine my, you know, delight when I come to read Chesterton years after the fact and find that the lyrics for, his, for Rich's song, Growing Young, are literally what you just quoted. Um, we are children no more. We have sinned and grown old, but our father still waits and he watches down the road to see the crying boys come running back to their home. Growing young, growing young. And he's like, it, it, all, the whole theme is that God is younger than us in this sense, as Chesterton says, like that he has the ability to exalt in monotony um, and that we need to learn that again. Uh, and that's that's what he's doing with Elfland. It's this sense of wonder and, like you said, gratitude. That's one of the biggest things here. And there's another image at risk of dwelling on this chapter too long. There's another image that struck me just as hard because I had always loved the book Robinson Crusoe. And the and the charm of this book, <laughs> weirdly, and I remember vividly explaining this to multiple people before I'd ever read Orthodoxy or knew that Chesterton made use of this, that you know what the best part about Robinson Crusoe is? It's the it's the lengthy section where he's retrieving stuff from the ship, the wreckage, and he's so happy because that day he got X, Y, and Z items, you know, and then one day he gets a Bible and he falls on his knees and he's like, thank you, God, that you gave me a Bible on this island. And it's just this sense of like, of gratitude at the rare, the rarity of everything, the incredible treasure that you have in each little thing in life, um, in life itself. And of course, Chesterton does exactly that, um, with the, with the story of Robinson Crusoe, um, if there's someone listening and they just don't understand what the heck I'm saying, help me say it better. What is he What is he saying about reality when he brings up this sense of everything coming to us as a gift, as if from a great shipwreck? Well, I mean, I think I think the main point that he's making there is is how you've you've put it there. We recognize that we live in a world and that things have gone wrong in this world. But that shouldn't lead us to then despise the world. It should lead us to more gratitude for the good that is still that is still in the world. And so, and this is the thing that that you know, if something is, if something basically makes it off, uh, he says, um, he says, all things have had this hairbreadth escape. Everything has been saved from a wreck. Um, and he talks about basically once you once you see that in the world it opens your eyes to the beauty of, of everything around you. And then you wind up recognizing that the universe is, is, is without peer. It is without price. There cannot be another one. It is a, it is, it is a, a jewel to, 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 to take place. So again, remember this is in contrast to the suicide of thought where basically he's seeing all these dead ends where this leads in this particular instance, he's recognizing no life. This is the foundational fundamental aspect of life. Life is something to be grateful for. Existence is better than non-existence. Saving something, even if it's out of a shipwreck, makes you makes you appreciate it all the more. And that image there is one of the uh the 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 things. So I just I would say that uh um that idea that everything sacred and good has been saved out of some primordial ruin, um that is the encouragement that he needs to then take him to the next level, which at this point, he's still not into Christian theology, right. but he's moving on this path toward understanding when that key is going to fit the lock and he's going to recognize 
the, the truth of the gospel. Yeah, I'm looking at the rate we're going here. We're, there's no way we're going to get through all the themes that I want to hit in this book. But um, and, and that will leave something for my readers to really enjoy because we're just glancing off the surface here. But the, the next chapter is crucial, I think. And it's one that um, is def- it's a defining feature of orthodoxy and of Chesterton's thought. And it, it's called the flag of the world. And it brings up this idea that I found just tremendously important. And it, it articulates something that I've felt for a long time that I didn't know how to put into words, which is that we need to be patriots, fierce patriots of reality of, of this world. What does Chesterton mean by that? And how does it figure into the broader you know progress of his thought here? Well, I mean, he's basically, uh, he he's he's uh, contrasting the optimist and the pessimist and their, their, their sort of views on life. And he's saying that one of the, one of the challenges here is that a lot of people like a lot of the, the pessimist hates the world so much that they don't want to do anything about making it better. The optimist loves the world to the point that oftentimes they overlook the problems in the world and won't want to change anything. And he's basically saying in order to really, to, to see something become better to see something improve. You have to hate it and love it at the same time. You have to hate what's wrong with it and want to fix it, but you've got to love it enough to think it's worth fixing. And so he talks about, and I think this is actually, again, talking about applying this beyond just the book. Um, he's talking about this when it comes to existence in general and about, and, and about the world, but it's also true of patriotism for the nation. You know, a lot of times people think, you know, if you're a patriot, you never criticize your country. Well, Bonhoeffer wouldn't have said that. Neither would, you know, Chesterton himself um, was highly critical of the imperial wars of the 1890s with uh, that, that the British, I mean, the Boer War and all of that. So um, I think I think Chesterton would basically say, no, to basically say you're never going to criticize your country is like saying I'm a patriot. Like it's like saying I love my mother, whether she's drunk or sober. And that's the wrong way to, to put it. You love your mother even when she's drunk, but you want to see her sober, right? So he's making that 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 case that um, that patriotism doesn't mean uh, overlooking the, the the problems that you find in in society or in the world, but that you've poured, sort of you've you've staked your flag there that you are loyal to the world. You've got to have that that sense of loyalty along with a desire to reform things, and I think that is. Um, that's one of the the ways he finally gets to this to this feeling of uh, of why again existence is better than non-existence and why and he talks about Christianity differentiating so strongly between martyrdom and suicide, you know that both of them are basically a carelessness with life, but one for the sake of something, one against something, and so he 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 makes that that distinction. Um, and then there's also just to throw this in there, I know we've, we're probably going to run out of time. You know, Lewis talks about chronological snobbery, you know, this idea that you just basically look down on things because they're old, uh, or Chesterton, they, some of that idea from Lewis comes at least partly from Chesterton because Chesterton in this chapter talks about the, the craziness of thinking that your philosophy should be based on the clock, you know, well, in that age, people believe this, but now we are, the, you know, as if, you know, your philosophy of life would change from two because it's Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Like that's not an actual reason to believe something or to not believe something. You have to believe what's, what's enduring. And all of that makes it into this, this chapter on, on, on loyalty to the world. You know, in, in many ways, this is a very much a setup to the next chapter. And I love how nested everything is, you know, everything in this book fits into the last frame that he sets up to where you're just like, here's a problem at the end of this chapter that needs to be solved. And here's the answer that I'm going to give to that problem. And, and the next chapter is called the paradoxes of uh, Christianity. And the, you know, he, he's, referring back to this idea that we ha- we must both love the world and hate the world. We must both love um, humanity and hate humanity. I- I'm rem- reminded of, um, you know, Aslan's words. I think it I think it's in Prince Caspian. He says to uh, Caspian that you are a son of Adam. That is both sh- uh, honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the head of the richest king. Be content. And that that's that kind of loyalty or allegiance to the goodness of God's creation um, and to the place of honor that human beings occupy within that creation that Chesterton seems to be talking about here. But um, he, he brings this idea of paradoxes right to the heart of Christianity. And this seems to be where Christianity becomes the central focus of the of the narrative of the book. Um, talk to us about the paradoxes. Why, why does he see Christianity as a religion of paradoxes? And what sorts of things is he talking about here? 
Yeah, this is probably second favorite chapter for me after the Ethics of Elfland. In fact, I'm I'm writing a book. Uh, I just finished a book that'll be published by IVP later this year called The Thrill of Orthodoxy. And I'm not, it's not the thrill of Chesterton's orthodoxy. It's the thrill of Christian orthodoxy. So it's not really, it's not a commentary on Chesterton. It's really about the, what, it's really about the thrill of Christian teaching when you actually recognize the the complexity and the beauty of it. Um, but But some of that book is inspired by what's in this chapter, which basically he's showing that in Christianity, um, the, you've got this, these marvelous paradoxes that are beautiful when you see them. And he recognizes, you know, Christianity was getting blamed for all sorts of opposite things. So the same critic of the faith that says, ah, Christianity is, is, is just for weak willed people, passive people who don't want to actually, you know, be active and do anything, just receive everything. Like people will say that. And then the same critic will say Christianity is also responsible for all the wars and bloodshed of the world, you know? And he's kind of like, well, well, which is it, you know, uh, like, is it one or the other, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, so he, he basically talks about how Christianity is getting blamed for being, um, for, for all of these opposite reasons. Um, and then he basically says, what if it's because Christianity is the thing everyone's reacting to? Cause it's really the thing. It's really what's real. So that someone short would think it's too tall. Someone tall would think it's too short, but the, it, this is the standard by which everything else is judged. And then he goes in on this, I mean, just goes down the list of these, the, these terrific ways in which Christianity holds things together in their blazing, beautiful glory. So yeah, Christ is God and man, not an amalgam, not a mix, not like a centaur, but fully God, fully man, not half man, half God, you know, like yeah. that. Um, uh, that's a, one of the key tenets. L- of the love Christian and faith, justice you know? don't mo- sort of mollify or mix with each other or amalgamate. They, they actually held together in their full blazing glory, you know, at one instance yes. in that up and, you know, side to side axis of the axes of the cross. This is where, and this is where the whole love the sin, love the sinner and hate the sin can come about because Christianity comes like a sword and divorces the action from the actor to some extent, right? Like you can forgive the actor while still having the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the antipathy you should have toward the action that, that brought about the problem. Like he's, he's basically coming in and saying, it's not Christianity hates the color pink. And he doesn't mean because pink is a bad color or anything. He means we don't, we don't take red and white and mix them. You have, you hold both red, both white at the same time in their fiery fullness, basically. And that is the beauty. And so I, I mean, just inspired by this chapter, I have taken this and I, I mean, I, I have gone through multiple doctrines of the Christian faith, well beyond what Chesterton talks about in my, in my, uh, um, my book on the thrill of orthodoxy, because I want to show people that actually Orthodoxy is broader than heresy, which is another key point that comes out in in the 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 book. And this chapter is it, it ends um, uh, with that that picture of almost like a roller coaster ride where it's been a whirling adventure. And and Christianity is like, but you know, the reason why Christians have have been so up in arms about even like the the a letter in a word. For example, like the the Nicene Creed, the 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 the, the difference in those debates uh, pre and post Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea. The reason why just one letter matters is because it is, as Chesterton would say, um, every inch counts when you're balancing, when you're when you're on a tightrope, you know. And so the fact that that uh, Christianity has made it through all of these twists and turns and all of these ways and m- moving this way and then that way in order to avoid, you know, getting punched from this side and then ma- dodging the punch from the other side, making its way. He goes, this is the whirling adventure of orthodoxy. And it's seen most clearly in its paradoxes where Christianity historically has not let go of the true to, if, if, if the Bible gives us two truths, Christians say, we're not choosing one over the other. We're holding both together and we're not mixing them together we're holding them together because that's that's what what orthodoxy requires and that's that key that fits the lock and what shows christianity to be out to be is uh, the beautiful thing that it is which of course goes back to um you know his idea at the beginning that mysticism is what keeps us sane that that paradox is at the heart of the search for truth i think back on there was a lecture by um rc sproul years ago 
where he talked about, you know, paradox is not a contradiction. God is logical. God is consistent with himself. A paradox just means something that apparently from our perspective is contradictory. But if you could get the right perspective and be omniscient, it would no longer be contradictory. Or there is a sense in which we can express it in a non-contradictory way. So when we say God is both one and three, we're not saying that he is one and three in the same sense at the same time. The the oneness is of essence. The threeness is of person. It's a, you know, this is that paradox where instead of a circle, there's a cross. There are two things meeting at right angles. And Christianity does this again and again and again. Um, the, the being of God himself, the hypostatic union, um, love and justice, the, uh, the freedom, uh, you know, uh, human freedom and responsibility versus predestination, um, the human agency in, in, in the scriptures, in writing the scriptures, together with the Holy Spirit's inspiration. You know, Islam falls off one side of that and says, well, God just used Muhammad as a puppet, you know, and just like wrote what he wanted to, dictated through him. And then liberalism falls off on the other side of that and says, well, no, the human author is just, they, they just were sort of um, inspired in the sense of, of excited and, and maybe, um, you know, inspired in the way that I'd be inspired by a sunset to write this. But then it was all their, their work. No, Christian orthodoxy holds it in the middle and says both things are true. They're not contradictory. It's paradoxical. And that's like part of the search for truth that you just have to get used to, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I think that's why I think that's why Chesterton's apologetic is so effective here is because he's he's showing you what Christianity actually teaches and he's demonstrating that this is that it's beautiful. Mm. Like that's that's one of the other aspects of this that I don't think we you know, when we think of apologetics, we often think of just sort of arguing, making an argument for the Christian faith. Yeah. Chesterton, by using pictures in the way he does and paradoxes and things like that is, is trying to, is he's like painting a tapestry. He's definitely doing arguments. Like he's, he's arguing all the way throughout this, but he's doing it in a way so that you actually see the, bre the beauty and breadth of it. And they're thinking, I, there's a reason this resonates with me. I want this to be true. Like this is what, this is part of what he's showing. And then he's also sh showing you, it's not just that you want this to be true. It's that, you know, deep down already that common sense aligns with mm. this. And I think that's one of the reasons the book has stood the test of time. Okay, Trevin, I'm going to ask something impossible of you here, but I have great faith in you, brother. We have three chapters left, um, and I don't want to give away everything, but we don't have time to give away <laughs> even as much as I hoped to. So could you give us a broad overview of how Chesterton lands this plane? What does he do in the rest of this book, and why is it like such an important turnaround from the, what we've discussed so far? Well, the, the rest of the book moves, but once Chesterton's already convinced of the basics of Christianity, which he, he's kind of gotten to that point at this point, once you get to uh, chapter seven, eight, nine, which is the, the eternal revolution, the romance of orthodoxy, and then authority and the adventurer, he, he's, he's making the case for Christian teaching as opposed to some of the dissent, dissenting voices about Christianity at during his era. So he's, you know, tackling, of course, the big question of miracles. C.S. Lewis wrote a whole book on that, right? Um, he's talking about um, where we, why we trust and believe the things we believe. Where where does the sense of authority come from? Um, is it in something just internal? Is it something that we only receive from others? Or how do we know what is a trustworthy source? Um, I don't know that I can really say that Chesterton completely lands the plane. Um, he, you know, you mentioned at the earlier about the, <laughs> the uh um the you know god not showing us his mirth because we couldn't have taken it in had we seen it in the scriptures you know that kind of a thing in the in the gospels um and so he he ends the the book with that that emphasis on joy is the gigantic secret of the 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 christian uh, as a verse to the the small publicity of the pagan he says but um so he he ends up with joy but you know you you finish the book and you think what, I mean, you're, it's, it's really moving and you get to the end and then you're like, what's next? Cause it's not like it comes to like a, an e an easy, you know, uh, you know, close with a tied up with a ribbon on it or anything like that. That's not the way that this book is because this book is that series of images, like you mentioned, and it's m working through these throughout the chapters. By the time you get to the end and the last image is over, it's like the movie is done and the credits have begun to roll and you're, 
just a little, just pretty exhilarated at the end by, by every, by all the, 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 the stuff you've been through and the education you've gotten working through a difficult book like this that has so many, so many treasures. Um, I would say, I, I do think one of the key points that he makes towards the end of the, of the book is this, this idea of, of orthodoxy being the fountain of revolution and reform, that it's it, the idea that to conserve something, you just let it be is wrong. In order to conserve something, you have to constantly be repainting it. Like the, the basis for reform is not in moving away from orthodoxy, but in having and preserving a certain uh, belief system. Chesterton talks about how people want to talk about progress all the time, but they do it in a weird way that actually doesn't make sense. A lot of people, uh, when we when we talk about progress, a lot of people in our day are talking about changing the ideal that we're progressing toward rather than actually holding fast to an ideal and trying to make progress toward that ideal. There's a very big difference in how you talk about progress based on a, an, a fixed and unchanging moral standard that we're aspiring to versus, well, let's just keep changing the morals and call that progress. So I think he's already foreseeing some of the moral debates and things that are going to happen down the road in the next, you know, within the next hundred years. And I think that's one of the things that makes that, 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 that latter part of, um, uh, of the book compelling. He, he's dealing with objections to the Christian faith in his time, but he's anticipating objections to the Christian faith in times to come. And certainly he has been right on a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I couldn't help thinking as I read that part, um, about progress and changing your ideal towards which you're striving of the constant remarks about you know, who's on the right side or the wrong side of history and the fact that, oh, it's 2022, Um, you know, it is the current year. Therefore, you should hold, you know, whatever progressive belief I think you should hold. Well, why? And Chesterton interrogates this and he's like, well, what are you moving toward? Sketch out your your shining city on a hill that you want to achieve. and, And then we can decide whether we should go there but don't give me this nonsense about well this the standards have changed the times have changed we've evolved toward what <laughs> what's the point point? and you, you know that's one of those one of those moments where you knock yourself in the head and you go Ch- Ch- how does chesterton have so much more common sense than i have because these sorts of arguments or rhetoric and they don't rise to the level of arguments they have the power to sort of put you back on your heels a lot of times because they come with so much social um, off, you know, social legitimacy. But if you just stop and think about it for a second, the idea of there being a right side of history presupposes a whole lot that your opponents have already denounced that there is some sort, some sort of discernible standard that's the same from generation to generation. That there is some sort of authority, and and that's one of the most relevant parts of the book, just because he's speaking to the need for, um. Uh, uh, consistent ideals and a, and something toward which you're striving. Otherwise, you're just lost in the wilderness and you're going to become a slave ultimately to whoever is smart enough to come along and take advantage of you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, again, this is where, and you see the, you see the influence of this in a lot of Lewis's writing. Mm-hmm. It's almost like Chesterton in some ways helps to inoculate Lewis from just falling for whatever is the, the, the normal thought of the time yeah. because he's, you know, Lewis is so drenched in, in, in medieval literature and other, in going back into other times and, and doing so not in a way that condescends or looks down on, but wants to learn from. And that's one of the beautiful things about, about Chesterton and his talk about progress and, and all of that. I mean, there's so much in this book. There's so much here. It's one of the great books for a reason. It's a hard book. I tell people when you get into this book, it's going to demand something of you. It's, it's one that you may want to, you know, it's small sips probably more than, than trying to do it all together at the same time. But it's the kind of book that is is worth careful reading and reflection and returning to. Well, this is a podcast, so we don't have exactly have a hard stop, but I do like to try to keep them to an hour. I want to ask you one last question here, Trevin, and that is about um, the edition that you've put together. What is the, the thing you set out to do? What is the sort of offer in this um, copy of Orthodoxy that you have worked through and added to? Um, talk to a, Talk to my listeners about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mentioned, and we both agree that orthodoxy is not an easy book to read, but there's no reason it has to be harder than it is. And one of the things that makes it hard is the formatting and the fact that a lot of the people that Chesterton talks about, we don't have knowledge of. A lot of the events he mentions as illustrations, we may not even be familiar with. 
So my goal in this book was to say, okay, this is a great book that deserves a lot of attention and we need people to read this book. How could I make the reading experience a little more enjoyable and make sure that it is a little more accessible without changing any of Chesterton's words? I actually don't change any of his words at all. There's little things, updating the spelling in a few cases, um, uh, breaking up these really long paragraphs that Chesterton has, breaking those up into smaller paragraphs and adding some headings so that you can kind of follow the train of thought a little bit easier. Um, uh, having some annotations. So when he mentions someone uh, or he mentions an event or he mentions a, a place that we as American readers in particular would be unfamiliar with that, you know, we've got, we've got that history. We can understand what he's alluding to and why he's using that example or that illustration. Um, and then I thought, you know, having a, I don't want to, I didn't want to overtake Chesterton's words, but I wanted to, by having a, you know, an introduction to each chapter and then a summary at the end of each chapter, I felt like that was enough for people, for me to be able to say, okay, here's where we are. Here's what you're going to find in this chapter. This is kind of where things are going. Look for these things and then let you read the chapter with the annotations broken up with the headings and then come to the end and say, okay, this is what you, we just read. This is the point that he's made. Here's some discussion questions, some things to be thinking about before you go on to the next one. I felt like that was a way to get people into the book, uh, just to ease the reading experience a little bit. I mean, there's some tough sledding in the book. There's no question about that, but I thought I, there's no reason it has to be harder than it, than it, than it is. And if I can make it a little bit easier, it's, it's for the good of those who might read the book. Yeah, I saw a strong parallel between what you were doing with orthodoxy and what Michael Ward recently did with um, C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, which is, you know, for C.S. Lewis, um, a difficult book. That's tough sledding as well. There's a lot in there that is just very opaque, uh, especially to American readers in, in this time period. Lewis is more recent than us, uh, than, than Chesterton. So um, to do that with orthodoxy seems like, an, you know, a precious and invaluable service. I, um, as I told you before we got on here, I honestly found the headings and the paragraph breaks to be one of the most, you know, helpful things about this. When you look at the walls of text that constitute orthodoxy as originally printed, it just, it's a convention that doesn't translate well across the, across the years. And just putting those returns in there um, really helps things. I know I said that was the last question, but I, I got one more question here for you. If my you know, we talk about a lot of books on this podcast. If my listeners have a big pile of books already and they've, they're have they saying, Shane, look, you said you need to read this, 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 and this. Now you're saying I need to read orthodoxy. I'm telling you orthodoxy needs to be moved closer to the top of your pile. Um, what would you say to someone to convince them that orthodoxy is especially important today and that they should move it to the top of their pile? Yeah, it's a... Um... I mean, it's a classic. It stood the test of time. It's a workout for the mind and for the soul. And we need we we ought to we ought to read books that stretch us. And this is one of those that will stretch you. Um, but it, it it also the I would I would say move it closer to the top of your 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 uh, to read pile because it's the kind of book that if you really take your time with it is going to bring a lot of. Uh, returns in the future. You're going to think differently as a result of this book. You're going to see things differently. You're going to see nature and the world differently. You're going to see the beauty of Christianity differently. Um, and there's nothing greater than reading a book that really transforms your vision in, 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 a, in a beautiful way. And so that's that's the reason I, I would give for for saying, yeah, make it a priority. It's it's going to be tough. In the first few chapters, you may think, what have I gotten myself into? Stick with it and work through it. And I think by the end, you'll you'll recognize, I, now, I see why this is a great book and why this has had a great impact. Couldn't agree more. My guest today has been Trevin Wax, author, columnist, and visiting professor at Wheaton. And we've been talking about his new annotated guide to G.K. Chesterton's orthodoxy. Trevin, thanks so much for joining me on Upstream. This was a fun conversation. Thanks so much for having me, Shane.